Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Islamic Golden Age Scientific Method by Kings and Generals. So this is another video on Islamic history. Last time we watched another video on the Islamic Golden Age, but on philosophy and humanities. Today we will be covering the other side of that coin, which is the scientific method. Now, I'm really not sure what we will go over in this video. I'm not a historian of science. What little I do know about scientific history is mostly contained to the scientific revolution of the 17th century and the following enlightenment. So I know a little bit about that, the development of sort of the modern European scientific method empiricism. So I'm really curious to see what we're going to learn about the Islamic Golden Age. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd very much appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or become a channel member for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. The Islamic Golden Age was a period of massive advancements and exchanges of scientific discovery in the Middle mm. Ages. And we've already sort of touched on that a little bit. We talked about humanities, philosophy, uh, and some of those topics touch science, right? Particularly in sort of the pre-modern era, there was less of a separation between what was science and what wasn't science. Science, at least in Europe, was often referred to as natural philosophy and was sort of seen as just another branch of philosophy. So the line between the two could sort of be a little blurry. In the previous episode of this series, we discussed the factors which led to this explosion on nearly every intellectual front, and we explored the worlds of theology and philosophy which shaped it. Now let's delve into how this community of thinkers contributed to the development of our understanding of science. Mm. Shout out to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video. Alright, you guys know the deal. Shout out to Kings and Generals, their video is linked in the description. Please go and check their video out, give them a like, and check out their sponsor. As you can see, their link is on the screen right now. Show them support for making these fantastic videos. The process for theorizing, testing, and analyzing through experimentation is known as the scientific method. Mm -hmm. For thousands of years, ways to systematically test phenomena to understand them have led to scientific breakthroughs. Discussions of scientific methodology have roots back to ancient Egypt and Babylon, but also independently emerged in ancient India among both Hindu and Buddhist philosophers. Mm. Now, of course, when we look at sort of the development of modern science and the modern scientific method, it's only really systemized in the last couple hundred years. But looking throughout human history, we have examples of scientists uh, we can see sort of rudimentary developments of the scientific method. So this sort of stuff pops up a lot throughout history. Uh, it just wouldn't become more widespread until a lot more recently. Likewise, scientific methods were a major subject among ancient Greek philosophers and physicians. Most important would be Aristotle, who developed mm. methods of both deductive and inductive reasoning. Once again, of course, Aristotle was a philosopher but he is sort of working on what we might now look at as science or scientific method. So we're looking at that lack of separation between humanities and sciences. You know, they were all sort of grouped under philosophy, that big umbrella term. And the often underappreciated Democritus, who mm. wrote extensively of the existence of atoms, an yes. object of matter which could not be broken down further and how he was proven right, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's really remarkable when we look back on a lot of these ancient philosophers, some of their claims which really couldn't be proven at the time, and yet now they have been proven thousands and thousands of years later. That's pretty remarkable. Breaking reality into its constituent parts. This was all theory, however, and in the Islamic world, theory met with testing to develop the earliest experimental methods. Here, the idea of running experiments and using measurement to test different hypotheses came into its own. Mm. Many of the great thinkers of the Islamic Golden Age were polymaths and generalists, so many names will appear again and again as they worked in different areas of study. Yeah, I mean, kind of similar to the European scientific revolution enlightenment 
of the 16 and 1700s is interesting. We see these eras where knowledge spreads greatly and there's learning. It often seems like we get these extremely intelligent polymaths who really specialize in a lot of different fields, both in the Islamic Golden Age and, like I said, the European Enlightenment. And I'm sure, um, you know, there's probably plenty of examples of this throughout global history of different golden ages and ages of learning where you have these figures who are, you know, they have expertise in many different fields. One great developer of experimental methods is one of the great minds of the age, Hassan ibn al-Haytham. Al-Haytham was born in what would be modern-day Iraq and did much of his work serving as a vizier or political advisor to the Buyid Emirate. Mm. Using logical reasoning, combined with empirical experimentation, he disagreed with many Greek philosophers on the nature of light and vision, which we wow. will discuss later. Al-Haytham saw himself on a quest for truth above all else, noting that it's difficult to find a hard path to make the journey. He practiced a process of relentless skepticism and finding the truth through observation. Very modern way of viewing things. I'm curious to see, we touched on this a little last time, how exactly religious beliefs interfaced with this scientific method. Because, of course, you want to observe the world, use empiricism, find what is true. Sometimes that can come into conflict, conflict sorry, with spiritualism and religion. Now, we saw last time that it seemed like the religion actually promoted the study of philosophy and humanities. Um, so yeah, I, I'm wondering if we're going to see how it interacts with science, because of course in a European context, I would say that if we're, you know, looking at the scientific revolution, you know, coming up on the modern era, Christianity more put a damper <laughs> on the progression of science, you know, it wanted people to stop doing science and stop being skeptical. Um, so, yeah, I wonder what we're going to see here. This thinking is an early form of positivism or the theory that knowledge about natural phenomena can only be derived through observation and reason. Exactly. Furthermore, Al-Haytham's writings indicate a form of using the principle of Occam's razor, or choosing the option with mm. the fewest number of assumptions when selecting between different explanations for phenomena. He often pointed out frustration with the lack of development of such thought in ancient Greek texts. Hmm. What Al-Haytham did yeah, well, the Greeks were a lot more about theory than practice. I mean, we kind of covered that already. We see the Islamic world sort of introducing more experimentation. And the Greeks did a bit of that, but they were always more focused on the theoretical, the ideological, instead of actually putting their theories into practice or experimenting. Um, and of course, that's what we're seeing here. That's what the Islamic world is doing. And that's what the Europeans will pick up hundreds of years later with the scientific revolution, they will try and take theory and actually experiment, you know, put theory into practice to find out what they can observe as provable. It, through his work, introduces the idea of induction to scientific methods. As opposed mm. to deductive reasoning, where one removes possible explanations for phenomena until only one remains, Induction builds a collection of evidence and uses reason to find a theory which is the best explanation given what's at hand. Hmm. This thinking is the philosophy behind modern science. Yeah. Another developer of the scientific method in this age was the ancient Persian scientist Abu Rehan al-Biruni. He took an even greater interest in systematic experimentation to find natural principles. Al-Biruni made much emphasis on the repeatability of experiments, wow. a cornerstone of the modern scientific method. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is incredibly modern stuff. I mean, repeatability, that is one of the most important facets of modern science. Uh, I feel like it's really hard to overstate how important that is. And Al-Biruni, I mean, man, he's got it thousands of years ago. <laughs> um, so that's pretty damn impressive. Or not thousands, but, you know, like... I don't know, well, like 1500, something like that. More than a thousand years ago, basically. He showed concern with making sure to prevent bias in observation, and so often repeated experiments many times. Al-Biruni desired to make averages of outcomes to compensate wow. for the errors inherent with tools and the humans who used them. 
These advances would found the basis of scientific development throughout the Middle Ages, and the yep. scientific method would not go through further development until well into the 12th century, a hundred years later. Islamic scholars also made marked developments in the area of mathematics. I'm just a quick thought. I'm also interested to see to what extent this influenced the European world, because we saw it last time with the philosophy and humanities that there was definitely influence on Europe, but a lot of the influence came much later. I'm curious if we're going to see the same thing here, because a lot of this scientific method talk we're seeing right now seems pretty advanced <laughs> for where Europe was at the time. Uh, it seems like, once again, Europe would have to catch up hundreds and hundreds of years later, but I'm wondering if there was any influence, you know, contemporaneously at that time. In many cases, they built upon scholars from around the world to cross-pollinate some of the most foundational parts of our understanding of numbers. Mm. We can start with the numbers themselves. The current system we have for the writing of numbers goes by the colloquial term Arabic numerals for a reason. Yeah. The Arabic numeral system is an excellent example of the factors which made the Islamic Golden Age so impressive. The number system has its origins with Hindu mathematicians mm -hmm. in India. Heading over to India. Now, I do not know anything about global mathematical history, right? But what I do know is that India is very much associated with the history of mathematics. Uh, there were tons of important advances in math that took place in India. Even for me, someone who doesn't know anything about the topic, I do know that in the 8th century, including the concept of a number zero. Hmm. From India, it came to the court in Baghdad, where it attracted the attention of the brilliant working mathematicians in the bustling city. And of course, this is another example of having such a powerful and well-connected empire. You know, of course, we saw the same thing with ancient Rome. It gives you the ability to build infrastructure and build networks of trade and communication that span across very wide areas, right? So you can go all the way from India back to Baghdad. That's a pretty long way to go. And not only can you do that, but since everyone's united under one religion, one empire, of course, there are a lot of non-Muslims, but it also means that everybody can relate to each other and communicate, at least within the caliphate. You know, Arabic would become the common language. And so it really connects everybody in a super important way. Most importantly, it came to the attention of Persian mathematician Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. In 820, he published On the Calculation with Hindu Numerals, advocating mm. for the mass adoption of a base 10 numerical system, which made doing mathematics much more manageable. So it more came from India then, and was spread by the Arabic world, yet we call them Arabic numerals today. The book would be copied and translated across Eurasia and North Africa. Its Latin translation was Algorithmi de Numero Indurum. This Latinization of al Khwarizmi's name would eventually serve as the origin of the term algorithm. Wow, okay. Within a hundred years. I did not know that. How about that? <laughs> and by the way, there we see some of that um, Islamic Arabic influence on Europe. That's what I was just asking about. Yes. Islamic scholars took this contribution, spread it, and began developing new and ingenious uses for these numerals, including the first case of using decimals to record fractions. I mean, look, there are many important ideas throughout history, ideas that would spread globally, but, you know, these numerals, Arabic numerals, uh, and the way that we use them, <laughs> this has got to be one of the most global ideas or one of the most global concepts we've ever seen. I mean, we can really see how important the spread of these ideas were. This powerful new way of symbolizing numbers was not the only contribution of scholars of the Islamic Golden Age to mathematics. One focus of Islamic mathematicians was the development of modern-day algebra. Mm. The word algebra comes from an Arabic term for reuniting broken parts. Al-Khwarizmi was also a major scholar who, along with the Greek mathematician Diophantus, has the title of the father of algebra. Yeah, I think we see a lot of influence also from the Greeks here. I mean, we saw that last time with the philosophy and humanities. 
Um, a lot of these Islamic thinkers are building on the ideas of the Greeks, and in this case, um, a lot of ideas from India. Um, it's sort of interesting. We can see this is also the influence of the Roman Empire, and you might be saying, what, but these are Greek thinkers. Yes, but the Roman Empire was very infatuated with Greek ideas, Greek philosophy, Greek science, and so the networks of the empire were used to spread those Greek ideas throughout, you know, the quote-unquote known world. Um, so a, a lot of the spread of these ideas can be attributed to, you know, first the ancient Greek states and then ancient Rome. Um, they were sort of on the same page <laughs> in, terms a lot of, in terms of a lot of these ideas. Much of his work concerned techniques to reduce polynomial equations. A different mathematician, Omar Khayyam, built upon Al-Khwarizmi's work to develop the world of cubic equations. A different Egyptian mathematician, Abu Kamil Suja ibn Aslam ibn Muhammad ibn Suja, would expand wow. on Al-Khwarizmi's work into an exploration of negative numbers and their notation. Mm. Outside of algebra. I mean, we're seeing a lot of important concepts that many of us learn in school today. Um, and that's kind of whack. I don't know about you guys. I was never really a fan of math in school. So that's a little upsetting. But, uh, you know, these are <laughs> incredibly important scientific and mathematical achievements that would change the world forever. So they definitely need to be recognized for that. Mathematicians during this period also made significant developments in areas such as induction, the working with and notation of irrational numbers, and the spherical law of signs. Hmm. This work would then translate into massive developments during the Islamic Golden Age in the scientific realm of physics. Ooh. Before Newton's laws of motion, Islamic physicists developed concepts of acceleration, reaction, and impetus. Many were early developments of what would eventually become Newton's laws of motion and wow. Newtonian physics in general. Yeah, I mean, of course Newton was an incredibly important and revolutionary figure in physics, but his ideas didn't come from nowhere, right? <laughs> it's not like they popped out of thin air. Um, not to downplay how incredible Newton was, but of course, like everybody else, he had influences. He was, in some ways building upon what was already there, even though his ideas were super revolutionary and important. But where physics developed in the Golden Age was the area of optics, or the study of the properties of light. Development hmm. of laws of refraction and reflection. And light was also very fascinating to the European scientists in the scientific revolution, particularly Newton. Newton was very into studying light as well. Began under the Baghdad physicist Abu Sa'd al Ala ibn Sal. He wrote an influential treatise investigating how curved mirrors bend and focus light, developing the first law of refraction, and inventing anaclastic lenses, a critical early invention in the development of eyeglasses and eventually the camera. Huh. Then optics would change entirely once Al Haytham began to work in the field. Al Haytham? The this guy's just brilliant, huh? Name Al Haytham, who pioneered the mm -hmm. scientific method, also often receives the title of the father of optics, and not for no reason. God damn! He began his work analyzing the work the Greeks had done on reflection. In his famous book on optics, he published significant disagreement with the likes of Ptolemy and Euclid on the nature of vision. The Greeks firmly believed that eyesight worked much like sonar or radar, that light was omitted from the eyes and reflected to give sight. Oh, wow. That's a very interesting perspective. Um, that is very, very different <laughs> from the way we understand things today. And I presume the reason it's very different is because of some of these Islamic thinkers. I mean, we're about to see what Al Haytham uh, proposed. Uh, I'm assuming what he's about to propose is a lot more similar to how, I mean, we know eyes work. Um, but that's fascinating. I mean, look, when you look back on ancient thinkers, they have a wide range of ideas. These were all really brilliant people, and some of those ideas were correct, some of them incredibly ahead of their time, and, of course, some of them were incorrect. You know, a lot of these ancient Greek thinkers, like we said, are theorizing. There's not too much experimentation, plus... They don't have the tools to do some of the advanced experimentation we would see later on. So, 
they got some very important things right, and they got other things wrong, or at least a little off. Alhatham disagreed, and postulated correctly that light reflects into the eyes, there we and go. could explain with lenses the physiology of eyesight, in doing so, developing the camera obscura. He also oh, wow. sought to understand the nature of the movement of light like that of the movement of objects, noting that many of the laws of motion seem to apply the same way. Mm. And the scientific development didn't stop there. Another place of significant growth was the field of astronomy. Much effort went into developing astronomy as part of a project to determine Qibla, the direction of the Kaaba. I'm curious how astronomy is treated in the Islamic world, because in the Christian world, astronomy would be very controversial. I mean, think of a figure like Copernicus, who put forth a heliocentric uh, version of uh, the solar system that was extremely controversial, and he got in a lot of trouble from the church for saying that. So, you know, I I'm curious to see how this goes. In Muslim prayers, one is expected to perform them facing Qibla anywhere on Earth. They also used astrology to determine when to perform important actions. Mm. Developing these fields, polymath- Because, as we can see here, astronomy can often go hand in hand with religion, different religious practices, but if it goes too far, gets too scientific, it can often start to contradict, or at least that's what happened with Christianity, and that's where all the problems came from. Maths like Al Khwarizmi also published documentation of the movement of the sun, moon, and planets. Mm. Centuries before Galileo, many Islamic astronomers expressed doubts in the prevailing Ptolemaic understanding mm. of the cosmos, the idea which places the Earth as an emotion. Uh, here we go. I just mentioned Copernicus. Um, I was talking about the heliocentric versus the model with the Earth at the center. So, and they're going over that right now. While center of the universe. While none of them ever stumbled upon a heliocentric model, there was a definite growing suspicion that Ptolemy's model of the universe did not hold up under observation and mathematical modeling. And they were exactly right, and this would be the controversy all those years later in Europe, though remarkably, remarkably Ptolemy's version of things held up for hundreds and hundreds of years, but then we get figures like Galileo and Copernicus and this was the whole controversy, these guys also, a, a lot later, said, yeah, you know, this version does not hold up under experimentation and further study. And, you know, someone like Copernicus, Copernicus got in a lot of trouble for that. Looking back down on Earth, Golden Age Islamic scholars made significant advances in geography, as well as a very dear subject to kings and generals, cartography. Mm. The Islamic age was full of Muslim explorers. They documented exploration ventures as far east as China and south as southern Africa. Hmm. Maps were also integral for many aspects of maintaining such a massive empire, for yep. the everyday needs of outlining just which territory kings managed, as well as making troop movement plans for generals. Because of this importance, geography and cartography were well-funded priorities of the Abbasid Caliphs. I mean, one of the other benefits of having such a massive, powerful empire, I mean, we've already talked about the networks of communication and the infrastructure, but yeah, cartography, mapping. If you have such a large empire, you know, all this territory, you know, you want to be able to see what territory you actually hold. You want to be able to see it on a map. And so mapping often flourishes when there are empires who, you know, need it done and they're willing to fund it. To refine the mile, scholars wound up calculating an impressively accurate estimation of the circumference of the Earth. The earlier developments in spherical trigonometry, like the spherical law of signs, allowed for Islamic geographers to develop better and more accurate methods of map projection, and even the very early beginnings of the polar-based coordinate method. Wow! Moving on to the realm of chemistry and material science, the Islamic Golden Age saw an explosion in the understanding of chemistry and the nature of compounds. Interesting. On to chemistry, yet another thing that wouldn't really flourish in Europe until the 16 and 1700s, though, it of course, in Europe you had chemistry slash alchemy that at one point were sort of seen as the same thing. Alchemy is seen as something like magical today, 
But at one point in the sort of medieval ages, if you were an alchemist, you are in many ways what we would call a chemist, though it had a long way to go <laughs> before it would become modern and scientific. Those who worked with materials in various ways were called alchemists. Ah, at this there we time, go. most of the ideas of the properties of materials were a combination of four essential elements, mm. fire, earth, air, and water. Each one was a combination of hot- I think this is also what the ancient Greeks believed, right? Hot and cold, and wet and dry. The fire was hot and dry, earth cold and dry, air hot and moist, and water cold and moist. This concept mm. of the material world is not merely the basis of chemistry, but of medicine. Wow. Before the discovery of germ theory, disease was thought- Yeah, and we've got a, a long way to go <laughs> before germ theory. Uh, roughly a thousand years. ...to be one of these attributes being out of balance within the body. Persian alchemist Abu Musa Jabir Ibn... It also sounds a little similar to the European humors. They thought your body was composed of these... Uh, I don't know if it was four, but these humors, like bile, black bile, all this different stuff. Uh, I mean, it's very wrong-sounding today, just like what we're looking at right here, but this is what they operated on for a long, long time. Ibn Hayyan wished to build upon this. As just one part of a truly massive body of work, touching on everything from alchemy to astrology to philosophy, Ibn Hayyan looked to sort the Earth's metals by the Aristotelian model. Mm. What he theorized was that metals were fusions of mercury and sulfur made deep within the Earth. What was most important, however, was that he believed making different combinations of different materials he could produce a fundamentally different metal. What seems like an implausible assertion today would have significant impacts on the world of alchemy. Hmm. Part of the goal of the profession oh, yeah. was the quest to turn substances into other substances. This is very true. Uh, you know, silver into gold. And, and this would be a practice very much adopted by European alchemists. Uh, this is the side of alchemy I was talking about that seems sort of supernatural or magical today. Not really scientific, but as we're seeing, other aspects of alchemy were more grounded in empiricism and the scientific method, so it was sort of a mix. Most famously, lead into gold. Ibn Hayyan's right. reasoning introduced the idea that a different metal, when mixed with something like lead, could produce gold. The search for this metal was of significant importance to Western alchemists, gaining mm -hmm. the nickname the Philosopher's Stone. Yes. This work was not a significant contribution to our modern understanding of chemistry. No. <laughs> it comes from a pre-scientific time, and alchemists, like many in the physical sciences, relied on only the theories they had around to work with. Yeah, like we said, you know, these guys were incredibly brilliant, and a lot of the stuff they said ended up being true, or ended up being the basis for truths that we would build upon later. But, <laughs> you know, in some ways they didn't quite have the tools or the ideas to properly study the theories they were suggesting. And so some of the stuff, like, you know, a lot of these ideas associated with alchemy are absolutely untrue and certainly not the basis for what we think today. You know, there's a mix of these ideas, but everyone's a product of their own time. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's good to look back on people in the past and go, oh, they were so stupid, laugh at them, because there's a lot of that that goes on in the modern era. Look, everybody is a product of when they were born, the culture they were born into, the ideas they were raised with. You know, if they don't have the tools or the ideas to know what we know today, there's no point in looking down on them for not knowing that. I mean, what they did was incredibly brilliant and their methods of observing and testing experiments when they could. In the endeavor- Not to mention, this is literally how science works. We posit a theory, we do some testing, we accept or reject, time goes on, we do more testing, we might reject that theory, come up with a new one, a theory that was once accepted as truth is later rejected and replaced with something else, so literally mistakes have to be made along the way. Things that are untrue are accepted, and then later disproven. You know, this is how it works. This is how the scientific method works over a long span of time. To discover the properties of these materials, while drawing the wrong conclusions, 
They however came up with various chemicals and inventions. We will discuss those more at length in a future mm. video in this series. I, I will say on that, I haven't seen any more videos from them on the Islamic Golden Age, even though it's been a while since this one came out. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe they have other videos, but I have not seen them. In working with these materials, Islamic scholars seem to have developed distillation, evaporation, and sublimation. Oh, Our not bad. last <laughs> stop on this tour of Islamic contributions to the sciences in this period is biology. In areas such as agriculture, the Arabs led a revolution in the sciences of cultivating crops and livestock. Mm. What the age managed to do very well is take staple Mediterranean crops such as olives and dates and make information about best practices available to a vast body of people. Agronomists like Ibn Basel of Toledo traveled across the Islamic world, learning and studying how farmers practiced their work in different lands. He documented nearly- I mean, this is something, once again, we would see much later in Europe. This reminds me of scientists in Europe or philosophers in Europe in the 1700s, traveling around different countries, studying agriculture, making encyclopedias or almanacs. Uh, I mean, we have Diderot's encyclopedia, we have Benjamin Franklin's uh, Poor Richard Almanac, and these would spread a, a lot of different ideas, but part of that was spreading methods of effective agriculture. So once again, familiar things we would see much later. 200 species of crops and wrote practical guides on the proper care of them. In many ways, this period burst the idea of the academic study of agriculture. It began a dialogue between farmers and agricultural scholars, which mm. would not only vastly improve the quality of farm goods, but prompt a search for new farmable plants and agrarian experimentation. Hmm. Archaeologists can measure the improvement of food production and thus population figures from these advancements. They can see evidence for the revolution in areas such as studying the size of sheep bones to see their growth, indicating improvements in animal husbandry. Likewise, irrigation improved with the introduction of various ways of pumping water into fields, using animals, the wind, or even water itself. Hmm. In places with ancient Roman aqueducts, such as the Andalusian city of Cordoba, they were repaired and brought back into use. I mean, Roman aqueducts were so important. I mean, this is true for a lot of Roman infrastructure. The vast scale and longevity of Roman infrastructure really wouldn't be repeated for a long, long time. And so, for thousands of years after these aqueducts are built, they are the best thing that people have. And oftentimes they fall into disrepair and disuse. No one has the skills to build them or repair them anymore. So even repairing and using some of these aqueducts again is an impressive achievement. Um, that also shows how impressive the uh, infrastructure that the Romans built was. Even expanded. Further study of animals came from translations of Aristotle's zoology. Islamic zoologists used this famous translation as they categorized various animals and cataloged animal parts. One of which is the most important, the human body. Ooh. Next time, we're going to focus on the development of the understanding and treatment of the human body during the Islamic Golden Age. So make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. I mean, hey, that sounds like an interesting one, but like I said, uh, I don't think they've continued this series. This video was uploaded in January of 2021. Um they seem to have sort of fallen off on this one. So I don't know if we're going to get more videos on the Islamic Golden Age, but I did very much enjoy the videos that we did get. Um, you know, we've got more videos coming up on uh, Muslim history, but if you guys have any suggestions for Islamic history, I'm always willing to hear you out and consider them. I've got a long list of reactions to get to. So if you leave a suggestion... Don't be upset if I don't get to it in the next week or even a couple of weeks. It may take me a while to get there. But yeah, I had a good time with this one. It's really interesting to see the development of these aspects of science that would be so influential and so important. And seemingly, many of these ideas and concepts really wouldn't reemerge for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, at least as far as I'm aware. 
Like I said, I know a little more about the European scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, and some of the ideas they talked about in this video sound similar to some of the breakthroughs that were made then. Of course, that was the 16 to 1700s. We're talking almost a thousand years after the Islamic Golden Age. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this one, please leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and check out the Patreon and channel memberships. I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.